Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only, only in the dark. dark. What Waits in the Shadows, Volume 6, Story Number 1. I used to be stationed in Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. I was working at a warehouse on grave shift 2200 to 0700 hours. One night I was working the shift alone and I saw pilot was completely drenched. Even though there's usually no one around at that time of night, I didn't think much of it because he didn't really look like the traditional Hollywood version of a ghost. Also, he seemed a little more happy than I would think a ghost to be. I went up to him and asked if I could help him. He told me that he was looking for the rest of his crew and that he wanted to know if I would help him. I asked for some information, like mission number, aircraft tail number, etc., so that I could look it up in our system. I wrote down what he told me and looked it up. Of course, I found nothing, so I went back to the man to apologize. He wasn't there. Again, I just thought it was kind of strange. Much to my liking, the rest of the shift went by quickly. When I got home, I emptied out my pants and found the paper where I had written the pilot's information. I decided to look it up on the internet. And this is the information that I found. It turns out that many years before, on November 11th, 1952 to be exact, shortly after takeoff from Agana Harman Field, while climbing by night, the aircraft suffered an engine failure. The crew elected to return for a safe landing when the seaplane stalled and crashed near the airport. Three crew members were killed, all two others were rescued. The aircraft was destroyed. Those killed their surnames were McClendon, McGregor, and Belts. And I never got a resolution or an answer if that was really a ghost that I had met that night. Next story. This occurred 15 years ago in Oakland, California. My boyfriend and I purchased a used oak desk and were bringing it home on a flatbed trailer when one of our tires blew out. We thought nothing of the tire blowout at the time. We were in the process of moving into a new apartment and we were setting up house. When we finally got home with the desk, we put it next to our bed. The ensuing three months, my boyfriend complained that aliens were watching him. He said this almost every day. I ignored this complaint because I thought it was just stress. Finally, on the night of January 1st, I woke up looking at my desk and saw the apparition of a young man sitting there staring back at me. I thought it was a hallucination or some trick of shadows and light, so I blinked and tried to focus my eyes. The apparition remained. He wore round glasses. He had bangs that were cut straight across. He looked to be twenty-something, was transparent and colorless, though I could tell that his hair was blonde to light brown. The apparition lasted about five seconds. When he vanished before my eyes, I felt a very tall presence standing beside the bed. Then the name Ray came into my head for no reason. I felt no fear during the entire incident. While I was still there lying awake trying to figure out what to do, my boyfriend woke up and immediately said, Damn it! I really feel like there are aliens watching me right now. That's when I told him we needed to talk. After the initial sighting, we kept the desk for three more months. The desk had always made loud cracking noises. I began to attribute those noises to the ghost. We were both pretty uncomfortable and couldn't sleep after my sighting. We finally got rid of the desk and moved to a different apartment, which solved the aliens watching me problem once and for all. And we actually sold the desk for a profit, something I've always felt guilty about, but only a little bit. Next story. My friend and I moved into an apartment in Spokane, and we were really excited about it. It was, was a historic building built in 1904 and was one of the first hotels in town. It had been bought by a company who restored it and we loved living in a building over a hundred years old. For the first few months, we didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. Then one day, my roommate told me that she had something weird happen. She said that she had laid down in bed and felt someone shaking her. Her room had no windows, so she frantically turned the light on, but nothing was there. We brought the possibility of a ghost but I remembered that she has a history of being a very deep sleeper and often has vivid dreams. I was sure she was just dreaming and left it at that. 
I slept in her room a few times before, since it was so dark, and hadn't had any problems at all. A few months later, I decided to take a nap in her room, since my room was bright. I laid down and fell asleep. I woke to a heavy weight, bearing down on my chest and shoulders, and someone whispering in my ear. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Only a few words here and there. I was able to move and jumped awake, absolutely terrified, and turned on the light. Nothing. I am pretty skeptical and just figured that although I hadn't ever had an experience like that, it must have been a dream. I laid back down and fell asleep again. I was awoken again by the same thing, not long after. The same pressure on my chest and the whispering. I could make out the word you, and it was being said frequently, but I couldn't catch the rest. I jumped up again and turned on the light. Again, nothing. I was a little more scared this time, but still wanted to believe it was just a dream. So I nervously made myself get back in bed and fall asleep. Not long after that, I woke up to the pressure on my shoulders and the whispering. Only this time it was angrier and louder. I flew out of bed and vowed never again to sleep in that room. I was troubled by this and talked to my roommate. We both weren't sure what to do, but she didn't seem afraid. She continued to sleep in her room. For the most part, she never had issues. Not too long after, she said that she had gotten into bed again, and she heard a loud hiss, and something shoved her in bed. She was so afraid she slept on the couch. One day I was cleaning my room, and had my bedroom door open. It was in the summer, and our apartment didn't have air conditioning, so all of the windows were open. I was folding clothes on my bed, and saw a man in an old, dark, heavy coat, standing in my doorway. I was so startled that I screamed, but he disappeared in an instant. I ran to the hall, wondering if someone had climbed through the window, but no one was there. I searched the apartment and nothing. I thought it was odd he was wearing such heavy clothing on such a warm day, and noticed that he disappeared right before my eyes. I suddenly thought, wow, maybe I just saw a ghost. The last time I had a strange encounter was a few months later. I just gotten a dog. He was a sweet stray that I couldn't say no to. He liked to sleep in my room by my bed. I woke up in the middle of the night for some reason and saw my dog alert and looking in the doorway. I looked there and saw a dark figure of a man, also looking like he was wearing heavy clothes. Then he was gone. I woke up my friend who was staying over and we once again looked around for any sign of an intruder. Not surprisingly, we found nothing. That was the last my roommate or I ever had anything out of the ordinary happen. I've told a few people and they all seem to believe that the dog scared our ghost off. I don't know for sure what happened, but all I do know is that it was fairly spooky. Like I said, I've never been a big believer and certainly never thought that I'd ever experience anything like this. I can't explain it. I would like to believe that I wasn't seeing things and that I'm not crazy, especially since it's never been a problem in my 25 years until I started living in that apartment. We moved out a few months later and someone else moved in. I drove by there the other day and wondered if they were ever have any similar problems to us. Next story. This happened in December of 1999. I have to start with a little background information first. I'm Roman Catholic, but I've never been much of a church girl, although I did celebrate festivals, especially the one for the Virgin Mary on December 8th. Mostly this is because of my culture since that particular celebration is a very huge deal where my family is from. As I said before, this happened in December 1999, and specifically it was a Sunday either a week before the 8th or the week after, but definitely around that time. My family and I have been working all that day with the festivities. And when we finally got home at 6 p.m., I was beat. So I told my parents I was going to sleep, and I did. The first thing that happened that day was that I had a nightmare and woke up. It was your normal nightmare, the one that you're being chased by something, and right when it's about to catch you, you wake up. So I woke up with my heart pounding. But I soothed myself, just like I always do when I have a nightmare, until my heartbeat goes down and I fall asleep again. The next thing I know... I'm looking into a totally white room when suddenly a beautiful female voice says to me, you must go through three sorrows 
before you find love. As soon as she finished saying these words, three flashes like strobe lights quickly happened. With each flash was a picture. The only one that I remember seeing clearly is the middle one, which was a knife being thrust into my heart. A classic betrayal image. Then I woke up again, with my heartbeat racing. Then again I soothed myself and fell asleep. Well, I wasn't sure if I was dreaming or not, to tell you the truth. Next thing I knew, I was looking towards my closet door, and there was a shadow person there with red eyes that was staring at me. At this time, my bed faced the attic opening and the closet door. Also had a three-foot statue of the Virgin Mary on my bureau next to the attic opening, which my grandmother gave to me and had nowhere else to put it. I have three windows in my room, so there's always light, and you can very clearly see at night because it never gets completely dark. And yet there was this shadow. This shadow thing walked towards me and thrust its hand into my chest and slowly pulled out a silver white cord from my body. I was horrified. I thought, oh my God, it's taking my soul. So I took the cord and tried to wrest it from its hands, but no use. It kept pulling this cord from my body and each time it pulled a little more. I actually felt myself floating out of my body. All of a sudden I remembered that the Hail Marys are supposed to guard you against evil. So I started to pray like there was no tomorrow. After only a few Hail Marys, the thing stopped and let me go and let go of the cord. It snapped so fast into me that I jumped out of bed. It was like the snap of a rubber band that is being stretched and then let go. Very hard and very fast. Well, I was still praying. That thing was still there looking down at me. But I heard its thoughts, or I don't know. Some type of communication happened because I remember it saying to me, you won this time, but next time you won't be so lucky. Then I woke up. Well, let me tell you, my heart was racing as fast as it could possibly go. And I didn't really want to go back to sleep because I thought that something else would try and get me. When suddenly I saw movement, it was the statue. She was walking towards me. As she did, she kept growing bigger and bigger until she was human size. Let me tell you folks, that was truly the last straw. I curled up into a fetal position and rocked back and forth while chanting, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. I probably peeked because I'm curious enough that I had to see what was happening and she was right beside my bed. Next thing I know, I feel her hand on my brow soothing me like a mother would when a child is frightened. As she did this, all my fears just went away, and I fell asleep into a dreamless sleep. The next morning, I remember going to class, but with that in my mind, I kept thinking, was it real? Did it really happen? Or was it just a dream? I told my friends during my lunch break about the strange dreams, since that was what I figured they were, since the alternative was just too fantastic to contemplate. When one of my friends said that at least part of my dream weren't dreams, because you're not supposed to remember anything while inside the dream state. Well, that got me worried. Because that meant that I still don't like thinking about it too much, but I'm sure you get the picture. So that night I came home thinking about it, but still trying to dismiss it in my head, just as a series of bad dreams. And I fell asleep without any incident. The next night, however, was a different story. While again thinking about what happened on Sunday, I suddenly felt the bed pressed down, as if someone suddenly sat down on the bed, except I was completely alone in the room. A litany of Hail Marys just started in my head because I did not want whatever was near me. The bed went back to normal, and I fell asleep. Unfortunately, this does not end my story. A year passed by without any incident. December came rolling back. Once again, it was that day my door refused to remain shut. My room had carpeting and the doors quirky, but it's actually fairly difficult to get it open, and yet I actually saw with my own eyes the knob turn and open, but no one was there. This is actually now fairly common for me. It happens all the time now after that first incident, and it's still pretty creepy. But I tend to lock the door now, of course. It doesn't help that whatever is doing this now likes to rattle the doorknob to make sure it is locked. As a follow-up to the story, two years later, I ended up talking to my aunt about what happened to me. 
and she gave me the most mind-boggling news. My cousin, who lived in Nicaragua, this is the country directly north of Costa Rica, had a similar experience with a shadow thing on the same night and given the time difference, the same hours when I was attacked, except that she was nearly choked to death by this thing. I'm talking about she had red hand marks on her neck from this thing. So now my question remains, and will always remain, was it all just a dream? Did it really happen? Next story. I'm reluctant to give too many details about these events because there was a crime involved. My father was briefly a suspect. They eventually apprehended a perpetrator who is still alive and in prison. Additionally, as a professional, any misinterpretation of events could, however unlikely, conceivably be used to harm my career. These events occurred in the early 1980s in the Northwest U.S. I was 10 at the time and lived with my father, mother, and sister. As unlikely as it may seem at age 10, I was already a skeptic and rather well-read. In other words, I was a geek. As such, I really hadn't been able to explain this away by simply saying I was too young to grasp what was happening. It started when I awoke one morning to find that my next-door neighbor's home had been roped off with crime scene tape, surrounded by police cars and overrun with reporters. There had been a murder. As I looked out my upstairs bedroom window, the mother of the victim looked up at me with scathing eyes. The victim was a girl in her late teens, early twenties, whom I will refer to as Sarah. I learned that Sarah had been murdered sometime in the previous twelve hours. She had been shot in the head. Soon thereafter, my sister's upstairs bedroom became a place to avoid. She would often awaken screaming in the middle of the night that there was someone in her room. Years later, my mother admitted that even she became reluctant to go into my sister's room to change the sheets or clean. I couldn't walk past the room without the hair standing up on my head. The cold in the room was very distinct and omnipresent. You felt watched. The best I can describe it is as palpable cloud of anger that you could walk through. I mentioned Sarah's mother because at some point in the investigation, my father was implicated. Sarah's mother had reason to suspect this, and as an adult, these many years later, I suppose I would have too. The legal aspect of things, however, meant we couldn't divulge the events of our upcoming Ouija board experience to the police or anyone else. My mother told me that they bought the board out of ignorance, believing its labeling as a game. Obviously a bad idea in retrospect, but it wasn't exactly like you could look up the topic on the internet and get a sense that using the board was not wise. Thus, as our family activity one night, not too long after the murder, my mother, father, sister, and I sat down to the Ouija board. It started off innocently enough, well, everyone laughing and accusing everyone else of moving the plastic Ouija please. We didn't make the connection between the board and the recent murder until after a couple of silly yes, no questions. I don't remember what we asked initially. It didn't take long for the endeavor to take on ominous tones. Whatever was moving the piece quickly made it known that her name was S-A-R-A and that she had been murdered. The piece made rapid, violent movements across the board, occasionally moving so erratically that it would pull away from everyone's hand, though it would stop moving at that point. I distinctly remember the chill we all felt in my sister's room was now with us around the dining room table. I suppose most parents would have sent the kids out of the room as soon as the implications were apparent, but we were all operating in a sense of shock. Thus we continued with the questions. I don't remember who asked, but one of us hit on the thought to ask Sarah to describe her murderer. She described a man with curly black hair. Next, one of us asked what type of car he drove, and the answer was that it was a gold VW bug. It was at that point that the gravity of the situation really became apparent to all, and my sister and I were sent upstairs to bed. Needless to say, my sister slept with a light on that night. Soon thereafter, I don't recall exactly how long, but I remember it being a few weeks. My father took me to the barber shop for a haircut. As I sat in the chair, waiting to start, I watched the overhead television. My father sat off to my side, waiting for me. It was at that moment that the police mug shot of a man with curly black hair was flashed on the screen during a local news broadcast. 
The man had been arrested on suspicion of a series of murders in the area the announcer explained. Then footage from the outside of the home where Sarah was killed came on. The footage was soon followed by the picture of a gold VW bug in the driveway of a one-story home. Needless to say, with events from the Ouija night still fresh in my head, I turned to look at my father. He looked at me at that moment. Neither of us said a word to each other, but we both realized this was the man Sarah described. But the eerie occurrences in our home only worsened. My room became equally uncomfortable to be alone in. Objects in my closet would occasionally move on their own accord. Clothes would swing or rustle in a closed room. A friend once stood in my room looking at my fish tank while I got something out of the closet about eight or ten feet away when we heard a voice in between us. We turned to each other to ask if the other had heard the voice. Neither of us had spoken though. Luckily, we had to move out of state for my father's work soon thereafter. I've since driven past the old home, but I've never stopped and certainly never gone back inside. I'm not sure why I felt compelled to tell the story other than to say that in the 25 years since it happened, it has never been far from my mind. It's hard to explain away the physical description of a murderer in his car as secondary to some sort of groupthink or overactive imagination. The events were profound enough that they shaped my willingness to consider the reality of a realm beyond the physical and pay attention to things spiritual, however you might define them. In the end, I suppose, I'm mostly just interested in whether anyone else besides me had a similar experience because I'd hate to think that I was all alone in this. Next story. I have a ghost in my house. First, a little history. We moved into this house eight years ago and bought it for a great price. Apparently, the owner was very sick and dying of cancer. His wife needed to sell right away as I now lived in New York and were renting the house out. I'd always been scared to go up and down the stairs. I would just get this creepy feeling. One morning my daughter said she was having a bad dream and woke up and there was a man in a dark cape and a hat looking at her. She closed her eyes and when she reopened them he was standing behind the door. She could only see his hat above the door. This would mean he was eight feet tall. She closed her eyes again and it was walking down the stairs. Maybe a few weeks after my other daughter told me of a very similar experience with the same caped man in a hat. I had a dream also. Something loud woke me. It sounded like marbles bouncing on the floor and I was paralyzed. In my dream I saw a very tall caped figure in my daughter's room. I tried so hard to move so I could get up and help her but I couldn't. I called my mother and told her what she thought about what had happened but that I wasn't going crazy. She told me that maybe I had an evil spirit in the house. She, I, and all my aunts started praying, and at that moment I no longer felt scared. However, every time I mention the ghost, something happens. One time I was talking to two of my girlfriends about it on my patio when my daughter's remote control car went crazy. I didn't even think it was working. Another time we were watching a show about ghosts when my mother-in-law told her about our ghost when suddenly the back door swung open and my mother-in-law's walker moved about three feet on its own. It was as if to say, Hi, I'm here. So, as much as I would like to think that it was gone, it didn't leave, even after all our prayers. Next story. My story began when I was five or six. My very first encounter with the paranormal was when my mom, dad, brother, and me were visiting some family in Mexico and we were staying in this house we used to own down there. And now a little background on the town before I begin. Supposedly the entire town was a battlefield. Running through the town was a path that all the soldiers used to get to a certain location. Some people have heard the sound of what seems to be horses and men yelling, giving orders. My grandmother lives right next door to the house which he says contains all that paranormal activity, including hearing military men on horses and seeing them as well. Back in that time, there was a lot of deaths because of the battles that were carried out. Any person that was killed was buried right there and then wherever they were killed. So it is said that the entire town is like a cemetery 
because none of the bodies were ever removed from the ground. Also at that time, there were many people who would bury any type of money or fortune that they may have had for fear of it being confiscated. So many of the houses in the town have money underneath them, or at least that's what's believed. In the house that we lived, there used to be a lady with her little son. Now we were told from the very beginning by the person who sold us the house that there was money buried there. Whether the money belonged to the lady, we weren't really sure. But I know for a fact that this lady lived there was a spirit I came into contact with as a child. I found all of the history when I was 16, but prior to that I had no knowledge of anything that may have gone on. I remember when we had just gotten the house. It had been a while since we had visited and it had been the second day that we were in Mexico. My parents were cleaning up the rooms we were going to be staying in and they decided that we should all stay in their room for the night. The next morning, it must have been about 7 a.m., I woke up to the sound of footsteps in the room. I was awake, totally awake, but I kept my eyes closed, thinking it was my mom. The weird thing about all of this was the footsteps seemed to be walking around the bed constantly. I finally sat up, and I could still hear those footsteps, but there was nobody. I knew that the footsteps were circling the bed, and I followed them like I knew someone was there. I knew their exact location, but there was no one. Every now and then the footstep would stop right on the side of the bed where I was, as if whatever was there was observing me. Then they would continue. I was younger at that time, and for some reason I wasn't scared. Kind of. I didn't feel like it was threatening any way, but I did tell my dad the next morning. He thought it was someone on the roof trying to get in. I told him moisture was coming from inside the room. I told him that I was following the footsteps, but he just brushed it off. Later on when I was 16, it must have been three years before our last visit, and my aunt was living in that house. She says that when they walked in on the wall in the dining room, there were big letters with the name Leti, L-E-T-I. Those letters seemed to have been carved into the wall somehow. She didn't think much of it until she started painting the room. She was painting it over when she said her paintbrush flew out of her hand and hit the wall behind her. It was then that this started to interest me. I asked one of my other aunts if she knew anything about the house and she told me about the lady and her son. And now they had been seen at my house. And at this point, the more information you get, the more of a mystery you have. Who was this lady and her son? And why are they still there? Next story. When my granddad was a lot younger, late teens, early 20s, he used to live in a place called Kempson in Kent. He would go out to the pub on the weekends and would ride back to his house on his push bike. He would ride back past the train station, which meant him taking a small dark lane down to his house. He had done this route many times at about 12.30 or 1 a.m., but one night, coming back down the lane, he saw a dark figure coming towards him. He was walking with his bike next to him at this point, and as he passed the figure, my granddad said, Evening, but got no reply. Thinking nothing of it, he just carried on down to his house. A few weeks later, he was doing the same thing, walking back from the pub with his push bike at his side. As he got to the lane, he started walking down and saw the same dark figure coming towards him moving very slowly. My granddad had a light on the front of his bike, which he turned on and shot it in the figure's direction. He saw what he described as a monk. He said it had no facial features, just a round shiny ball where there should have been a face. My granddad was shaking from head to toe with fear and he walked backwards with his bike very slowly. He got out of the lane jumped on his bike, and rode the long way around to the house. What he had seen on that night made him very ill with fear. He didn't want to leave the house for quite some time afterwards. His dad asked the local police officer if he knew anything about it, and he said they got more than one report of the same thing. All I know is that afterwards my granddad never took that route again home from the pub.
Next story. One night in 1977 on the outskirts of Rocky Mount, North Carolina, off Highway 43, me and my family lived in an old wood, white and black house that still stands there to this day. I always felt like this house was haunted because every night after 12 a.m., you would hear a chair rocking in the back of the house and in the living room around the same time. It would sound like a fight had broken out. You could hear wrestling going on. These are a few reasons why I felt this house was haunted. One night, while I was watching TV, I glanced and saw a shadow of something about six feet tall moving outside the window. It scared the hell out of me. I screamed and ran to tell my mother just to return and find nothing was there. Then one night, we went to bed. My mom and dad slept together. My oldest sister and youngest brother at the time slept together. And me and my older sister slept together in separate beds. Though the night something moved the three of us to different beds and we never woke up during the move. We woke up at the same time that Saturday morning, shocked, freaked out, wondering how could something move us through the night and never wake us up. I woke up in the bed with my daddy. My mom woke in the bed with my oldest sister and my brother woke in the bed with my next to oldest sister. It was very chilling and no one until this day has been able to explain it. If you'd like to be scared to death, move into this house in front of West Edgecombe School. You'll think you're a hell of a believer or not. This is the place where evil never rests and it always sounds like something is running at you through the woods. On the back porch, you can leave the kitchen for a hot minute with hot dishwater and come back less than a minute later to find ice cold dishwater. I found years later where the rustling sound came from. I found out that one night someone was having a party and twins were there. Somehow one brother had a girlfriend that he was crazy about just to find out his brother was sleeping with her too. One twin pulled a gun out during a fist fight in the living room with his twin and shot and killed him there. I'm sure that that house is haunted and some poor soul continues to rock unpeacefully in this house each and every night.